That'll get your blood going. I don't know what happened to everybody. Where in the world? I know what they're doing. They know they got to be here Easter, so they took off. Now, I'm going to have to hunt some people down. I can see that. Uh, we have something coming up. We have an anniversary coming up. And uh, Nancy's going to say just a few minutes, a few words about it. And uh, she knows where things are here, and I don't. I told her one time, if, he thinks, if she gets sick, real sick, she needs to tell me because somebody needs to know where we can find stuff in this church. So she's got a few words to say, and then we'll continue. I want to be sure that you can hear me because this is pretty information that I think you'll be uh, enjoying hearing. Yesterday, something special happened with this church. Back on March 16th, 1924, this church was dedicated as the new First Methodist Episcopal Church. As I give you a short description of this church and how it began, the ushers will be handing out to you an ornament commemorating the 100th anniversary of the dedication of this new church. We would like to give a big thank you to Janet Kent for revitalizing this ornament for this occasion. This church came about because the congregation of the ch current church felt that they had outgrown the building and needed to erect a new and bigger building. The old building was showing its age. The steps were worn and rickety, long cracks were showing in the brick walls, and the foundation uncertain. A dingy dustiness pervaded the whole building and nothing could wipe it away. The spidery steeple struck by lightning in 1903 stood unsure above the bell tower. The new church was bought and built on a lot catacornered from the second church and the second church building was sold to the Fairfield Masonic Lodge. It was 1922 or 23 that plans and estimates were presented to the congregation for a new church building at a cost of approximately $50,000. Now this is back in 2023 or 1923. The board of trustees were instructed to proceed with the project, trusting on faith that the money could be raised. As it turns out, instead of costing $50,000, it cost more than $80,000 when finished. This church building is Gothic in structure, solid and heavy. It was a year in building and was completed in 19, March 1924. There's three floors. The first, or basement, what we now call the fellowship hall, contained equipment for social and recreational gatherings of the congregation, a stage, a baptistry under the stage floor, ladies' parlor, restrooms, and some Sunday school rooms. The main floor has the auditorium, or the sanctuary, more Sunday school rooms, pastor's study, which is now the historical room, and the choir room. The sanctuary is square with high ceilings supported by great arches with a dome effect. Great chandeliers hang from this high ceiling providing indirect lighting. Under the balconies on either side are cloistered pillars and aisles adding to the grand effect of the sanctuary. There are 35 stained glass windows with brass plates below each window in this church that were dedicated in memory of various families' loved ones. There are six double swinging doors and two single swinging doors entryways to the sanctuary and the balcony area. The third floor is the galleries or balcony on each side and at the back. There are three stairways to reach the balcony areas. There were four classrooms on the third floor, one of which is below the bell tower, which is right up there. The church pews and flooring of the balconies are original to the church when it was built. The pulpit is, a is on a wide and roomy platform at the south end of the sanctuary with choir loft and pipe organ and pipes to the back of the area. At the north end of this sanctuary is a vast and arch opening into what was the Sunday school rooms and was closed as desired by a rich dark red velour curtain, which was replaced later on with a green velour curtain, and you can see part of it now, and it is still there. Nearly 1,200 people can be seated in the auditorium with an unrestricted view of the pulpit. As I mentioned at the beginning, this information is mainly about the church building itself. Information on the educational building, which was built in 1961-62, is a story for another time. The main floor of the sanctuary was updated when a major remodeling was done in the early 1980s. This involved new pews with cushions, carpeting, removal of the pipe organ and pipes, adding the three section stained glass windows in the south wall, changing the pulpit and lectern and communion table, and updating the choir loft area. 
Before I close, I would like to thank our church secretary, Kathy Schmitz, for helping develop the insert that's in the program today. The picture on the insert gives you an idea of what the church looked like back in the day. Probably not as far back as 1924, though. In closing, I would like to read the gentle admonition that was in the pamphlets given to the arriving congregation at the 1924 dedication. Whoever thou art that entereth this church, remember that it is the house of God. Be reverent, be silent, be thoughtful, and leave it not without a prayer to God for thyself, for those who minister, and for those who worship here. Well done. I need to go up in the balcony and see what's up there. That's a classroom up there? Oh, I'm going to check that out. If you don't hear from me or see from me again, you'll know I'm locked up there and I need help. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we're sitting in this building 100 years old, 100 years later. We thank you for the insight these people had. that They built such a beautiful beautiful sanctuary and we thank you and we praise you lord give us ears to hear what the spirit has to say as we go through our service in jesus name amen good morning and happy saint patrick's day everybody um our announcements this week the easter flower forms are due tomorrow so if you have not done that yet you need to uh, the Easter offering this year is going to go for local missions, and there are Easter offering envelopes on the back table. Uh, the Lifeline screening, again, is going to be on Monday, April 22nd. There are uh, forms back there that give you the information that you need. Um, this week, the Bell Choir will rehearse at 5 o'clock on Wednesday, and the Chancel Choir will rehearse at 5.30 on Wednesday. <coughs> Excuse me. On Thursday morning, we will be delivering food to the High Rise and to Fairway Apartments. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but my voice is going on me. Uh, <clears throat> and on Saturday morning, the women of Cornerstone will meet here at the church, and Bless Blooms is going to be here to tell about their, their business. Their, uh, they are very uh, faith-based, and they want to tell their story, and so that be very interesting to hear so we encourage all of the women of the church to come next Sunday will be Palm Sunday so we're going into the Easter week and next Sunday at two o'clock Alice Dyson's birthday celebration is here at the church and we encourage all of you to come and help her celebrate uh, the thinking of you cards this week are for LD Matthews and for Nancy Cole anyone have any other announcements if not, would you please stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> Make, a Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. Remain standing for our opening hymn, David is not here this morning. I'm hoping he's not ill. Uh, none of us have heard from him. So if, if, if he is ill, we pray that he gets well very quickly. Uh, our first hymn is page 380. There's within my heart a melody. We'll sing verse 1, 2, 4, and 5. I will do the best I can. <laughs> swept across the broken streams, stirred the slumbering chords again. 
Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every life, keeps me singing as I go. Remain standing for our affirmation of faith on page 881 and on our screen. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and then buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. The Messiah will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's time for prayers, uh, praises, or concerns. Uh, I do want to mention, please keep LD in, in prayer and Nancy. We want to get them back in the house and uh, on their feet and in the house. And so anybody else have a praise report or a... Anybody? I have a joy. Donnie and I have a new great-granddaughter uh, Jay and Kayla Stanley had, had a new girl Thursday. Her name is Della. Della or Stella? Della. Okay, Della. New baby. Anybody else? My goodness, you're quiet this morning. <laughs> Anybody else? And I guess she's just talking to me. Okay. For a child? Yes. Okay. And we want to welcome Tom and Felicity. Did I get it right? Olivier. And they're visiting this morning. <laughs> and anybody else? Melissa, a student at Jasper School, Kenley McGill. She and her family lost their trailer in the storm Thursday night, and they are without a place. So grand, I believe they're living with Grandma, but they will need everything. I think that's the one that is, they're having a, it, is it Jenny's, Min, Jenny's Minis? Yes. Is that it? They've got a tip jar there, I think set up.
for that family today, and then some of the proceeds go to that family. Jasper School is also collecting money and gift cards. Yeah. All right. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a glorious day you've given us. I just thank you so much for today. Sunshine, Lord, I pray for LD and Nancy. We miss them when they're gone, Lord. And I just pray strength for their bodies. They get back on track. I pray, Father, for Della, this new baby, Lord, that's come into the world, that she grows strong and be the woman of God you intended her to be. And, Father, for this child that needs prayer, and you know the circumstances, we ask you come alongside that family. We ask, Father, a special uh a special blessing on that child, Lord, that you have your hand on them. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this day. And we pray, Father, that for each one of us, God, that we will hear what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is page number 462, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, and we will sing all four verses. Father, as we come together at this time to take up the offering, we just ask, Father, that you just bless this offering, bless those that give, and I pray, Father, that it further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture this morning is Matthew 16, verse 15. Jesus asked a question, but whom do you say that I am? It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. The title of the message is, Who Do You Say I Am? I want you to go back in time with me this morning for a few minutes. And Jesus is at the end of his ministry. He's coming to the very, very end of the ministry. And, and he took a trip. It's the first trip he took outside of Palestine. For three years, Jesus has just poured and poured into these disciples, this, this little band of 12. And he poured all the knowledge he had, the love he had. I believe that he was so careful with what he taught them. And then he knew these were the men who would carry the gospel around the world. And so he was very careful to make sure he taught them well. And I'm sure it went through his mind had he done enough. Had he taught them well enough? There is not a teacher alive that does not wonder the same thing when they preach on Sunday morning or teach somewhere. At the next thought is, I wonder if they got what I was saying. I wonder if they heard it. And so this is what's happening. So he's going to take them and test them. And he takes them away from the Pharisees and the religious crowd and the Sadducees. And he says, I'm going to get them by myself. And that's what he does. And in Matthew 16, there is a paper I think they handed out. Uh, but in Matthew 16, 13 to 18, if you have your Bibles. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are here today because a man named T Peter recognized Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He wasn't the only one, but he was in this group. And he, and you know, how many of you know people used to keep their opinions to themselves? <laughs> they don't anymore. If you don't believe me, read Facebook. Oh, my gosh. And I just cringed. The other day somebody said, what's the worst restaurant you've ever eaten? And I thought, why would you put that on there when there's people in town who have businesses? And people jumped on that like white on rice, I'm telling you. But... <laughs> That's not my message this morning. My message is, Jer Jeremy Bowen was presenter of the BBC, and they did a documentary on Jesus Christ. And he said this, the important thing is not what Jesus was or what he wasn't. The important thing is what you believe about him. A massive worldwide religion spanning over 2,000 years says something about the man himself. Uh, Bono, who's a uh, lead singer in the rock group U2, uh, asked if the claim that Jesus being the son of God was far-fetched. Listen to his answer. No, it's not far-fetched to me. Look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy. Had a lot to say along the lines of the other prophets, be they Elijah or Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius, but actually... Christ doesn't allow you to do that. He doesn't let you off the hook. Christ says, <clears throat> no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me a teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I'm Messiah. I am God incarnate. So what you're left with is this. Either Christ is who he said he was, or he was a nutcase, one or the other. Who is Jesus? It's, it's the foundation of what we believe in here. He is the Christ of the living God. And, and I think about our final destination determine, is determined by what, you're, you're, what you say about that. You know, when Jesus asked, 
Who do you say I am? What should your answer be? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Mark 8, 36, it says this. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in the adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory and the holy angels. You know, a lot of people have an opinion on who Jesus was. I know who Jesus was because I've accepted him in my heart, and most of you have in here. But let me ask some people what they thought about Jesus. Mormons, who do you say Jesus is? Jesus was the spirit child of heavenly father and mother, uh, brother of, of Lucifer, won the designation to be Messiah. He was married at the Cana, Cana of Galilee and had many wives and many children. Do you remember that being in the word? Well, I hope there's a resounding, no, it's not in the word. Don't be thinking it is. Ask Jehovah Witness, who do you say Jesus is? And they'll say he's the son of God, but not part of the Trinity. Muslims, who do you say Jesus is? Well, we love Jesus. He was a great prophet, and he's a messenger of Allah. Allah is not God. If you ever, uh, there was a, a group a while back, it's been several years ago, and they wanted to build a huge uh, multi-religious uh, together, together, and they would have Allah as their God because these Christians said that is, that is God. It is not God. Jehovah God is who we serve. And Allah, well, I don't want to get into it. It's, it's not God. I'll just put it that way. Uh, let's go a little bit further. Hindus. Hindus say he was a holy man. He was a wise man and, and one of many gods. And Buddhists, well, they say Jesus was an enlightened man and a wise teacher. A lot of people said he was a healer and a teacher and a good man of wisdom. But he's more than that. He's not just a good man. He's not just just a healer or a teacher. There's a do you know if you did you know that baby ducks will follow the first thing that moves when they're born and they think it's their mother. Did you know that? There's a in Bali, they have a a, a, a post in the ground. There's a flag that waves and if the ducks are born around that, that's their mother. And they'll eat in the rice, rice fields, but they keep going back to that one spot. Jesus knew people and ducks. And sometimes we're like ducks. We follow the first thing that comes out the gate. Well, that looks like that's good. It's shiny. It's good. And we follow it. Or we follow a speaker that we think is just amazing. Boy, we want to hear that again. That is great. And Jesus knew people. He knew their strengths. He knew their weaknesses. So did uh, Winston Churchill. Somebody said to him one time, congratulations, look at the size of the crowd you brought in to hear you speak. He said, you ought to see the crowd that would come if they were hanging me. <laughs> he knew people. He knew them. People are fickle pickles. They just are. Now consider this. Consider our Lord. Jesus had the finest teachings that were ever written. And if you get in and study them, which reminds me, those of you that have been coming uh, to, to class, they are, they are learning a lot, and they'll tell you that. And there's several in here that come. And uh, it's on uh, Tuesday at 6 o'clock in the evening or Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I want to see a lot of people over there, and then eventually I'll, I'll split it and come back over here if, if we get enough. Uh, but Jesus had a way with crowds. He had a way with crowds. And the common people would come, and they'd listen to him. They thought he was great. And they finally had a voice. But we're not here because he was a good public speaker. There's a lot of them out there. But hundreds of people would sit on this hillside and listen and a lot of them had lives that were changed. He was a great healer. We know that. He healed the blind, the lame, those that had emotional problems. 
If you don't believe me, ask the woman with the issue of blood who suffered for 12 years. And he healed her. Ask her what she thinks of him. Or blind Bartimaeus, who had his sight restored. And then there was Peter's mother-in-law, who had a fever. He touched her head. She got up and served them. And the lepers. The lepers. How many of those lepers he touched? He touched them. The Bible is full of examples, but there's more. John, the book of John tells you there's so many more that are not written down. Jesus could raise the dead. When he heard the master say, Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth. He couldn't have just said come forth because the whole graveyard would have come out. Jesus had the power over death. Remember the widow of Nain? And she's taking her son, burying her son. Her husband's up, gone already. I can't even imagine what went through her mind. And Jesus interrupts him. And he walks over to the beer and he touches it. And he tells that young man to get up. And he did. He raised the dead. And then there was Jairus, whose daughter was dying. And they were headed towards the house. And a man came and said, you don't need to come. She already died. And Jesus said, believe me. Believe me. She's going to be well. And he did. That's not why we gather to worship today. It's not. We're here because of Jesus, who Jesus was. But we have to know who he really was. Who do you say Jesus is? It's got to be the only answer. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, there's things we need to do for the kingdom of God. Once you come to a point where you can echo those words, that you're the Son of God. Your life's going to change. I mean radically change. You could ask Mary Magdalene or the woman at the well or Paul. What about Billy Graham? His life changed when God got hold of him, and boy, did it ever. Uh, John Wesley, Matthew, I'm sorry, Martin Luther, all of them. Who do you say I am? If you get that answer right, you'll discover the reason for, for life. Jesus wasn't worried about the masses or what they thought. He knew the crowds would be cheering him on, and a week later they're going to be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. People, who do you say I am? You know, Jesus was building a team. Every good pastor or leader will have a team beneath them that when they're gone, this team can take over. If there's no team to take over, they're lost without a leader. And so that's what he was doing here. There are so many examples of the voice of people. How many of you believe that Hollywood gives great, great advice? If you do see me in my office after church, we need to talk. Hollywood gives the dumbest advice ever. And people, because it's a star, oh, it's Taylor Swift. I've got to believe what she says. Oh, it's whoever. I've got to believe what they No, you don't have to believe what they say. You have a mind to think. Think. Don't do that. Let me give you some people who thought their voice was right, and they told everybody. Fred Smith submitted a term paper proposing the reliable overnight delivery of packages using a fleet of airplanes. His Yale professor gave him a C and said this, the concept is interesting and well written, but in order to earn a better than a C, you're going to have to have something that's feasible. Fred Smith left Yale and started FedEx. The professor is still working on his salary, and Fred's doing very, very well. Debbie Fields. Debbie Fields pitched this in investment idea to a banker. And she said, I want, I've got a, a vision of we're going to put uh, uh, Mrs. Fields' bakeries in all of the malls and wonderful cookies. And he tasted one. He said, well, they're wonderful. But he said, most people like, like crispy cookies and not these soft, mushy ones. And I, it's just not going to fly. And he wouldn't give her the money. A Liverpool music group called The Beatles went to Decca Records and, and in 1962, and this is what the, the guy said. We don't like your sound. 
Frankly, guitars are a thing of the past. I bet he could kick himself every moment of every day. Sometimes voices are wrong, even when they come from a well-known celebrity. Let's talk about Oprah for a minute. Oprah, <clears throat> some of you may follow her, but, but Oprah uh, uses, she preaches that she is a Christian. She says that. I'm a practicing Christian. At the same time, she's telling you all roads lead to Christ. All, all, I'm sorry, all roads lead to God. The word of God doesn't say that. She says that. And here's another one. The word says in John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. During her uh, daily devotionals, she has started reading Sufi daily word. And, and that is, uh, I'm not sure how to explain. It's a mystical belief of the Islamic faith. Very few are smart enough to do it, they feel like, or knowledgeable. It's only special people that can get this path. That ought to tell you something right there. And so she practices that. Even if it's her voice, it can be the wrong voice. It's not what their voice, it's what they say. You know, the Bible says wide is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to destruction. And many, uh, wide is the gate and broad is the, is the road, I'm sorry, that leads to destruction and many that enter it, enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life and few find it. I thought about the thief on the cross. He hadn't walked with Jesus. He hadn't watched him in ministry. You know, he really didn't know much about him, except he knew he was innocent. He did know that. And he heard the other thief on the cross really talking terrible to him. And it says in Luke 23, don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we're punished just, justly. For we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man's done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into his kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Who do you say he is? Once cynical Nathan, Nathaniel, he said, well, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. He spoke that after crucifixion. The woman at the well who had the checkered past, she said, you know what? I, I, I believe him. He, I believe he's the Christ. And she ran through the town telling everybody. The centurion who had to stand next to Jesus and watch him die said this. He heard his cry, saw how he died, and said, surely this man was the son of God. All these and many, many more throughout history say he is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. You know, here's a lot of play. Here's who Jesus is. He tells us this. Uh, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he, he who believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I am the gate. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I am God's son. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What's Jesus' main concern today? You know what it is? It's you and me. He's concerned that we got this answer right. We know he's the son of God, and we need to speak that out. You know, he's counting on you to further the kingdom. He's counting on you to be like him, to be about his father's business. If you don't see that Jesus is the son of God, the true son of God, you won't stick with it when times get tough, and your level of loyalty will go down. Who's crazy? Have you ever had, now I'm just using this as an example, I wouldn't do this, but have you ever sat in a pew and the worst guy in the world 
sits down not too far from you and you're sitting there thinking, well, at least I'm not like him. You're comparing yourself. Or maybe you hear about somebody, you go, well, at least I'm not like that. I'm not that bad, for heaven's sakes. I'm not that bad. Jesus says, don't compare yourself to anybody. Compare yourself to me, to me. You know, Amos 7 says there's a plumb line. I had to ask Jerry what that was years ago, not being a carpenter myself. <laughs> and he explained it to me very carefully and slowly a couple of times. But do we love as he loved? Do we forgive like he forgives? Do we live our lives willing to do anything for friends and, and sometimes for our enemies? Using his standard, nobody's going to measure up. That's why he says we're all sinners. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is why Jesus is worthy to be our standard. Because he is the embodiment of what he teaches. If he says love, he loves more than you do. If he says forgive, he's forgiven. If you can forgive people on the cross for nailing you to the cross and bringing such pain, you can forgive anybody. Jesus is all we need. He's all we need. I read a story about a waitress. And this waitress <clears throat> couldn't get a smile out of that woman. That was an old woman sitting there eating. She had a frown on her face. He, she tried everything to get a smile. And she couldn't get it. And finally she thought, well, she's depressed and dejected, so I'm just going to say something really nice to her when she leaves. So when she left, she says, I just want to tell you, I want you to have a nice day. And the woman said, well, I'm sorry, but I've made other plans. <laughs> you ever been like that? Monday morning comes and instead of saying, you know what, I've got a good week ahead. Man, I've got a good way. Everything's going to go good. I'm just believing that. Or do you get up on Monday morning and go, oh, boy, here we go. Here we go. Back to work. Back to that place. Back to wherever. Jesus says, you've got more than anybody on the face of the earth. You've got him. And you can delight in that. What are your plans? If Jesus said right now, who do you say I am? What would you say? I hope you would say you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In the book of John, he wraps it up. He actually wraps it up in the chapter before he quits. And it's in John 20, 30, 31. And it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. If I were to ask you this morning, who is Christ, who is Jesus, I hope your answer would be the right one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I delivered the message you gave me. And we all have to answer that question, Lord. Who do we say you are? Father, help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what we believe. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Before she sings, I want to say one more thing. A little boy at Jasper School came to Kim, who's the nurse. And he said, do you know Jesus? And she said, I do. He said, do you know he's the son of God? And she said, well, I know that too. And she said, and do you know, he said, do you know that the devil wants to tell you something different? She said, I do. He said, do you know that if you believe that, you'll end up in hell? <laughs> she said, he had it all down. Somebody had told him the right way, and it's the truth. She just didn't expect it. Anyway, it's time to sing. Our final hymn this morning is number 672, God Be With You Till We Meet Again. Please stand. <laughs> 